Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to our Let's Play series in Space Engineers Survival, version 1.190.101. Uh, so I did a couple of little things on the uh, both the base and on the Mega Miner in between episodes. Um, I added these landing gear on the back because the janky thing we were doing was switching back and forth between being a sw uh, ship and a station. Um, actually got me stuck as a station at one point. Um, apparently that can happen if some voxels get caught like inside a block or something I'm not sure how that happened necessarily but I couldn't figure out how to fix it and I didn't even have any uh, save backups that had me still as a, a ship so what I did is I briefly went into Space Master creative mode and uh, copied my ship out and pasted it outside of the hole and turned it back into a, uh, a large ship and I added these landing gear on the back. They do stick out a little bit, but they don't stick out any further than these drills do. So it still works. Um, it still does fit down in the, the hole that the drills create. Um, it's still not perfect because until we get to the point where the landing gear is inside the hole, we're still going to jiggle around a lot. So I'm still working on a ideal solution to that. What I'm thinking is at this point we'll build like a scaffold out of uh, truss armor blocks and completed armor blocks. Uh, up to the landing gear so that we can lock onto that. Um, anyway, that's my thought. And in order to get these landing gear on, I actually had to extend out a little armor uh, column here to attach the antenna to, and to attach the landing gear to as well. Um, on the uh, industrial um, complex, I flipped the battery around. I wasted the power cells to do that. Got some scrap metal back, but you know that's just iron, and power cells are actually nickel and silicon too. So it's not a a perfect return but you know whatever I actually ended up with a whole bunch of iron from drilling out to get to that iron deposit I uh, ended up with a little bit of actual iron ore but just from the stone going through the basic refinery at the you know relatively low yield that the basic refinery gets you I ended up with a whole bunch of iron I'll show you how much in just a minute um, and I also moved the reactor over to the other side because it was upside down and you know that was a problem for me anyway as far as what we ended up with um, as you can see, we did end up with 52,000 iron ore, uh, just in the, the process of drilling down there and finishing up that particular load of cargo. But just from the stone to get there, I ended up with over 200,000 ingots of iron, uh, 25,000 ingots of nickel, 41,000 ingots of silicon, and then I actually put all the gravel in a separate container. And I really am thinking I need to get a mod or write a mod to do something productive with that gravel because 156,000 gravel taking out 57,800 liters of cargo space is a little bit ridiculous. So yeah, I'm going to try to figure out how to, how to manage that and like I said, at this point I'm thinking some kind of mod um, involving concrete or maybe writing one that allows us to kind of, what, what I'm thinking is put the gravel into an assembler and condense it into like some crystals or something and then the crystals can go back into the refinery I don't know I'm I've got some thoughts and I'll learn a little bit more about modding because I've never done a mod for space engineers or really anything else I mean I've tinkered around with mods in Minecraft but that's about it um, so I'll, I'll figure out what to do with that and I'll probably go ahead and activate a mod of some kind to do something productive with all that rather than just throw it out because that kind of bugs me, the idea that you can have a resource and there's absolutely no way, even with, you know, some sort of maximal progression to do something productive with it. So I'm going to figure that out. Anyway, we have a lot of resources now. Um, I have not figured out what the yield is on the iron ore or actually the stone in the full refinery. Um, so I'm going to do that real quick um, before we get started here. But the plan for today is actually to work on the script. Uh, so let me find the refinery here. There we go. So I, uh, I actually just took screenshots of the yield in the uh, survival kit for stone and the basic refinery for iron ore and for stone. Um, so I do have those numbers. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but they're they're in screenshots in my Steam thing. And I mean, I didn't publish them or anything, so I know them, but you don't. But really, that doesn't matter all that much. What I'm really interested in and what really makes more of a difference is what the yield is in the refinery. So I saved those for the video. Anyway, for iron ore, the yield is 70% by default, 
140%, which is awesome, um, with the yield modules attached. And then for stone, the yield is 0.92%. That's doubled. So it's, it's pretty low. Oh, that's for nickel. Um, it's 11.8. I should have pulled that out. It was 140 before, so it's 11.8, which works out to 5.9. No, it's not 11.8. It's 10.8. 5.4. 5. So it's the same as gravel. No, because gravel's doubled. So it's 5.4% for iron. Um, 0.51? No. Point. Oh my gosh, math. Point four six. Point four six percent. Zero seven. Point two seven for gravel. Uh, and that's in the, the full refinery and or just the, the regular refinery. Anyway, we can throw all this into our storage. All this, all, you know, relatively very little of it, but whatever. Anyway, we've got a bunch of few little components. These are the components that we had left over from the solar panel we took off of the mobile construction module. Um, we may end up just disassembling these or we may end up finding something constructive and useful to do with the the solar cells at some point, but today is not that day. And some interior plates, just random stuff. And we got a little bit of ice, but we do actually need to get some more ice at some point. Most of the ice that I had ended up going into the uh, O2H2 generator on the Mega Miner, so we'll need more ice just so we. So we'll stick this in the refinery. And the fresh blocks function is we're doing this in the initialization, so this only gets not actually doing it again. At this point, um, you know, we can just stick this in here and uh, have it run every tick, but we're not doing that for the time being because I'm not super worried about it. Uh, I don't think I had this thing here about um, removing the, the flat because the way that this is assembled, this update type, is it's actually a bit hash. Um, and that's a little bit of a complicated programming concept if you're not familiar with, you know, how programming works and how, and even people who do program. Are sometimes not familiar with how this works. It's a little bit complicated, but um, most people know that computers operate in binary, on, off, um, yes, no, one, zero, uh, is how binary is done. But the way that these bit hashes work is it's basically taking one of those bits, because usually you're dealing with at least eight of them. Eight by eight bits is called a byte, and it's how 
at least originally, you know, back in the day when they had a more limited character subset, uh, characters were all encoded using 8 bits, and that got you between 0 and 255 um, as a result. And, you know, you can Google binary. I'm not going to try to teach you binary here. Um, but anyway, what this is doing is this is checking to see if the update 100 bit is set by using this single and. If you do a double and, it says this is true and this is true. If you do a single and percent, it's saying, does this include this bit? Like if you separate this all into bits, is this bit set? Um, and if that ends up not being zero, that means that the bit is set. So what this does here is it ends it with not this bit. So it basically flips this bit off. And then we're saying if there's nothing left except update none, do nothing. But if it's something else, meaning it was called with an argument, then we're going to be processing arguments here. And that was all to lead into another reason why I wanted that refresh blocks function was because if we're running arguments, one of the arguments we're going to do is flipping this include connected flag so that we can get the uh, statistics for everything that's connected to the, the grid this is running on, not just the, the main grid, not just the, the colonizer, for example, but for the, the, the mega miner and the industrial complex as well. So if we flip that bit, um, you know, if we run that argument, uh, then we will want to refresh blocks at that point just to get all the stuff that's attached to here. And then if we turn it off again, we'll want to remove all that stuff and, and take it back off. So that's why that is, is on there. Um, and, you know, there's going to be plenty of other arguments that we will eventually implement. And then something else that we changed is the display cockpit oxygen now has this thing here about tanks. We don't have any oxygen tanks, but at some point we might. We're going to want to be able to, to read those, so I just wanted to lay out a space for them on the panel. Right now we're just hard coding none, because there are none tanks, so we don't have to worry about it. But as we develop this and as we get further along, we will want to actually look for those and we'll probably attach an oxygen tank somewhere just to test it. Um, and then within the power summary function, um, we did quite a bit of work actually, or I did quite a bit of work because I did it all off camera. Um, all of this stuff was initially within this top if block here, checking to see if it was a hydrogen engine. So it was only counting hydrogen engines. I actually moved the max power um, check out of the if block so it would count it for all of the power producers because they're all going to be contributing to the max power. Uh, but as I did that, I realized that batteries in recharge mode have a max power output of zero, even if the you know even if they're a large grid battery with a max power output actually of 12 megawatts. So up in here, I am checking if it's a battery block. Now we could actually um, try to cast this, and we could you know just explicitly retrieve battery blocks and not all power producers, and it would it would do this this logic for us. But rather than do that and have a separate loop and a separate, you know, parse through the grid terminal system or whatever, I just figured, okay, well, if it's not a hydrogen engine, we'll come down here, we'll do is, else if, then we'll check and see if it's a battery block. So if it's a battery block, then we are going to actually cast it at that point to a battery block so we can access some of the, the useful bits on the battery interface, one of them being charge mode. Uh, so if charge mode is in recharge, then this is aux max power, this is auxiliary max power. And that's something that we changed in the layout. I'll show you the layout of the, the panel in a minute, even though I briefly displayed it or demonstrated it in, in the previous episodes that weren't about scripting. But um, aux power is basically power that's possible to be used but isn't being used. And if it's in recharge mode, then we want to say it's auxiliary power. And then we will read charging battery max output. And this is similar to the function that we have now for reading hydrogen engine fuel because I extracted that out into a function as well. Um, because, like I said, the actual max output, the flag that's on all of the power producers, um, reads zero when a battery is in recharge mode. So that's not useful, um, and it would actually be here. Uh, so we're reading that from the detailed info, and I'll, the same way that we're reading the fuel statistics for the hydrogen engines from the detailed info. Um, so that's all we're doing for batteries right now. We are also going to want to check the, uh, the storage level for batteries. So I'm going to add that in this episode after I'm done reviewing the, uh, the changes that I made off camera. And then down here, we did a little bit of uh, sorcery to distinguish between producers that are enabled and producers that are functional. Um, so you can have an enabled hydrogen engine that just doesn't have any hydrogen in which case it's not technically functional. Um, 
So I said here, if fuel stat's zero, which is the fuel amount that we're counting here, if there's no fuel, then function equals false. It starts off being initialized to true up here at the top. So if it ends up being false, we're not going to count it towards our power statistics, even if it's turned off, because else if function will add it to aux power. So even if it's turned off and would otherwise be added to uh, auxiliary power, we're still not going to add it if it doesn't work. Um, and we're also going to turn functional to off if the, the charge is empty on a battery or if the, the uranium is empty on a uh, reactor. So if it's enabled and it's functional, then we add the max output to active max power, we add the current output to total current power, and uh, that's the, uh, the main statistics that we're seeing on the display. And then we'll also add the max output to aux max power if it's turned off but is still functional. So because we have functional in both of these, we're requiring it to be functional in order to count it towards anything. But if it's actually enabled, then we will count it towards um, active power. And a battery can be enabled but in recharge mode. But as I mentioned, it comes up with a max output of zero, so we're not going to end up adding this twice because uh, we check for battery in recharge mode here. If battery is in auto mode or the battery is in discharge mode, then the max output will read correctly. Anyway, then we're displaying everything. I consolidated the display a little bit, because again, this is supposed to be a summary. This doesn't have to be, you know, in detail of how everything's working, um, you know, each individual hydrogen engine or whatever, like we had when we left off at the, the last scripting episode. So we're getting the current total power all together and doing that out of the active max power. So how much we're using versus how much we could produce with what's turned on now. Then we have the auxiliary power that's available, and that's on its own line because we're not using any of it. Then we have the battery percentage and the hydrogen percentage. Um, and right now, battery we're not actually checking, so we're hard coding in 100. We're going to change this. Um, we're going to create a, a value up here that we're actually going to, to add up and figure out what the legit percentage is and insert that here. Then we have the total fuel amount over the total capacity, which we're tallying up from these read hydrogen engine fuel, and we demonstrated what this is actually doing uh, in the last episode. I just pulled it out into its own function so that it was a little bit easier to, to follow what's going on. Um, and that's being displayed as a percentage. And then we're going to do ice. That's hard-coded to zero. Uranium, which is also hard-coded to zero. And that is, again, something that we're going to work on today. Now, the read hydrogen engine fuel, this is the exact same stuff that was in the, the previous episode. I didn't actually change the code, except now we're returning all this as an array of floats. So uh, index 0 is the fuel amount, index 1 is the fuel capacity, and then return it all as one thing. Really, it's better to do like a struct um, so you can name stuff and, and you know access it using this kind of dot notation rather than using an array But that's just too much work for something that only has two values and only is ever going to have two values So I didn't bother Then this read charging battery max output is doing a similar sort of thing, but we're parsing the detailed info for batteries rather than for um, Hydrogen engines and we only need one value so we can just return a single float instead of a float array and we only need two lines of code instead of um five to, to read it all out. So this is splitting it up by lines, then splitting at the colon, and then getting the number, basically, and then trying to parse it. Um, and we're checking here uh, whether or not it actually says megawatts, just on the possibility that we're using a small grid, small battery, because I don't remember what their output is, but I'm pretty sure it's less than a megawatt. So we need to deal with the fact that it's probably going to be in kilowatts at that point. So if max output 1, which is after we split on the space at the end here, um, when we've just got the number, that's going to be the units. So if it's megawatts, we multiply by 1. If it's anything else, then we're going to multiply it by 1,000th um, so that we can convert it to megawatts because 1 kilowatt is 1,000th of a megawatt, and we will end up returning the, the megawatt value. So that's recharging battery max output. That's rehydrogen engine fuel, and that's all been kind of... Uh, extrapolated out of this method here, display the power summary. All this is up on the GitHub, so if you want to see this code and look over it and copy it and steal it, I am more than happy for you to do that. The GitHub link is in the description on the previous two videos, I think. It's certainly on the previous um, one scripting video. I don't remember if I added it into the, the oxygen stats video, but anyway, this is all here. And I am keeping it updated as I as I add things to it. If you only want parts of it, you can go through the previous commits and get the bit that you want. In any case, 
the job for today is to add in the possibility of, um, I don't think we're actually using the engine count anymore. I'm just going to go ahead and take this out. We may want that again if we do detailed statistics, but we don't need to worry about it for the summary, so I'm not going to bother having it. Um, first thing we need to do is read the battery charge, how much is actually on the battery. And I have to remember what the values for that are, and I don't right now. But I'm going to put this up here, separated by a line still, but up here because this is total fuel, that's, that's specific to hydrogen engines. So now this is specific to batteries. So total charge equals 0F. Total charge capacity equals 0F. And I'm going to call this charge amount. Be consistent. So this is what we're going to be adding to, and we're going to add it down here. So total charge amount plus equals plus equals battery dot current charge. I don't remember if that's what it's called. It's probably not. not exist in the current context. Where am I using it? Oh, I'm adding to it. I'm incrementing it here, but it doesn't exist anymore. Take that out. Does not contain definition for current charge. Okay, yeah, I figured that was wrong. All right, give me one second here. Let me check on what this is. Again, I am going to the API documentation that is on the internet. The link to that is also in the description and is also in the description for the previous scripting videos. Um, I've mentioned that it is very helpful even if it's not as helpful as it could be, it is very helpful. Uh, 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 give me one second here, let me get it loaded up. I tend to close my browser before I start recording in the hopes that I won't need to do this, but then I usually do. But closing the browser is still a good thing because Chrome tends to keep a whole bunch of processes open for like every tab you've ever opened in the history of your life, so um, it's definitely uh, better on memory and I seem to lag less when I close Chrome before I start recording. Anyway, API index is one of the options over on the sidebar there. So let me look at that and then my battery block is the interface that we're working with and it is current stored power and max stored power. What did I say? Current charge, <laughs> way off. Current stored power. What? I just read this. How did I screw it up? Current stored power. Did I get the capitalization wrong? I probably got the capitalization wrong. Yeah, I got the capitalization wrong. See, that's my problem. I'm used to JavaScript, and in JavaScript, we use camel case. C sharp uses whatever this is called, where you capitalize the first letter as well, and I'm not used to it, so I keep screwing that up. I apologize for that. Total charge capacity plus equals battery dot max stored power. So now instead of hard coding 100 here, we will do total charge oops I need to do some parentheses here I need two of them total charge amount divided by total charge capacity hey is that new I don't remember there being a scroll bar on here before. That might that that must be new. That's cool. <laughs> that's how excited I get about that. Um, okay, so that's the the ratio. Multiply it by 100 to get the percentage, and then to string 
we're just, we don't want decimal places and zero to turn into a string and make it look pretty. Compilation successful. Excellent. So that's what that looks like, and it should still say 100 because we've got our batteries in recharge mode. So they should be fully charged. Now, if I turn the batteries off of recharge mode, this should flicker. We lost some of our aux power, and it went up to uh, main power because we've got one megawatt from the hydrogen engines, we've got one megawatt from the nuclear engines, and one and eight megawatts from the the batteries. So some of that from aux transferred to main power because we put the batteries into automatic mode instead of recharge mode. And because we've got so much other power on here, it, it's not even getting down to 99% before it goes back up. So we'll demonstrate that at another time. I don't want to actually disconnect right now. So it just means I'll have to to reconnect again, and I don't feel like it. Um, so next, this is a little bit more complicated. That was pretty straightforward. You know, it's just pulling two values and um, dividing them together after we add them all up. This one's going to be a little bit more complicated because we want to go through and trace the um, inventory connections of both the hydrogen engines and the reactors. We want to trace through those and um, find all of the um, words find all of the O2 H2 generators that are connected to the hydrogen engines. We're going to want to find all the hydrogen tanks that are connected to the hydrogen engines and consider that in our, we'll consider the tanks in our fuel capacity and tally the ice directly because the ice when fed through the O2 H2 generators obviously gives us the ability to generate more hydrogen. So that's useful information to have if you're running off of hydrogen engines. Okay, how much hydrogen do we have? Okay, great. How much ice can we turn into hydrogen? That's uh, kind of the next step beyond that. And the advantage of that is that once that we've done that, we're going to use essentially the same logic to figure out how much uranium we have access to for the reactors. And I said that in that order, but I think that the uranium is actually going to be easier because, first of all, we, we haven't even done anything with the reactors. So the, the first and, and easiest thing we can do is count the uranium that's already in the reactors and then trace through the, the cargo conveyor network to find any other uranium we have that is connected to those um, in order to get a total. But the first thing we're going to do is count the uranium already in the reactor. So the first thing we need to do is identify is this a reactor that we're looking at? Because we're looking at is it a hydrogen engine? We're looking at is it a battery? Now we have to look at okay is it a reactor? Then what we're going to do is we are going to save a reference to the inventory um, you can put in a number here for different inventories so like the assembler for example has two inventories it has the input and the output reactors only have one inventory so I can just use zero I don't have to worry about what number goes in there in particular. And I think that returns an I my inventory. It might actually just return an, um, no, it doesn't, never mind. I was one, there's, there's one of these methods in here that's, that behaves a little bit funny and just returns a my inventory or my whatever. It doesn't have the I in front of it. It doesn't actually return the interface. It returns the object itself. But this is not one of them. Um, so then the next thing we want to do is get a count of the uranium and there's a specific method for that, I think, that'll count all of it, even if they're in separate slots. And I don't remember what that is. I did not prepare very well for this episode. I apologize for that, too. Uh, oh no, oh no, inventory. I, my inventory is the method we want to look at. And then 
not item count. I don't really want volume. I want mass. That makes it simple, actually. I can just do current mass. I don't really have to look at the inventory. Although there is get item amount, and that would be better. It would be a little bit more versatile, because current mass is going to give us the mass of all of everything. And since it's a reactor, it can only hold uranium, so that's going to give us the answer that we want. But get item amount is kind of the more generic way to do that. Um, I think for our purposes, we're just going to use current mass, because there's really no point in screwing with it. And that needs to be up here, too, as a variable that we're extracting out. Float total uranium. Um, when we go through the connected inventories, we will have to use that um, that more detailed function. Because in other inventories, like if we have extra uranium in a cargo container, for example, uh, it will matter you know, what it is that we're actually looking at. We can't just count all of everything that's in here. So this is going to be uh, total uranium mass plus equals reactor inventory dot current mass. Did I do that right? I did not do that right. Cannot be applied between my fixed point and the float. Okay, so the mass is actually returned as a my fixed point, which is basically a float. So we can just cast it. Now, instead of hard coding zero here for our uranium, we now want to use total uranium mass. And you see that updated to 200 and change. Um, we want to actually get rid of the change because that just makes the display look ugly. And 0 .00, I think that says 81 kilograms of uranium. Well, it's actually, you know, since it's uranium and we're using relatively low power requirements, especially when everything's turned off, um, that'll actually last us for quite a while. But nevertheless, I do want to pretty this up. So. That's just going to take the float as it is, convert it raw to a string. If we call to string on it and do n, let's go ahead and do two decimal points. This is only one number that we're putting on here, so we can do two decimal points. And we're not caring about the capacity because we're eventually going to be counting up uranium and all the cargo containers as well. So now we've got 200.01 kilograms, and that rounded up. We don't actually have quite that much. It's a little less. Anyway, that is the amount of uranium we actually have in the reactors. Now, this is going to be a little bit more complicated, and I'm actually going to extract this into another function because it's going to be a little bit more complicated. But we want to count the uranium that is in inventories connected to these reactors. And I've been struggling with something. See, because in, in this ship, it's relatively straightforward because every single bit of our stuff is connected through the conveyor network. Like anything that has an inventory is connected through the conveyor, through a single conveyor network. So if you've got, you know, some uranium ingots in the cockpit, for example, in the cockpit's cargo storage, you can get them into the reactors. If you've got them back in the um, in the connector, if you've got them in the medium cargo container, whatever it is, wherever it's it's stored in here, especially if it's ingots and ore, because they fit through the, the small uh, conveyor ports, you can get it into the reactor, and it's not a problem. Um, on the other hand, it's possible that you might have, you know, a dedicated cargo container just for one reactor, and then a separate cargo container for the other one. Um, and this is especially true because we have two separate O2H2 generators on here that are both providing hydrogen into the hydrogen tank and the hydrogen tank is providing hydrogen into both of the hydrogen engines. And again, that may not always be the case. So how do we do this for the, the summary screen in particular that makes sense? Like, should we count only the stuff that has access to both or, you know, all of the, the things? 
should we count you know separately and display two numbers like this one has access to this much this one has access to this much and what I think I decided to do is that I'm just gonna get the total all together so I'm gonna take the the inventories that are accessible to everything of the type and then I'm gonna make sure it doesn't get doubled first of all because that's gonna be a concern and then I'm gonna get the stuff that's available separately and count all of that towards the total so that means it all needs to really be in one function call. Like we need to call the function with the a parameter of everything that we're we're trying to see if it's connected to, and then we can check for inventories connected to both, and then check for inventories that are only connected to one of them, and kind of do some shenaniganry to make it all you know boil down to one number. So what that essentially means is that we're going to have to do our actual assessment outside of this loop once we've already gone through all of the producers and assessed all of the producers. So in the meantime, in order to get to that point, we're going to have to create some lists to deal with the fact that um, you know we don't actually have everything within our scope of awareness right now. And uh, yeah, I am going to do those separately. I could do like a dictionary and index it by the the block definition here that we're that we're messing with, but I'm not going to bother with that. I think that that's overly complicating things. So we're going to do a list of I my power producer. Um, hydrogen engines is a new list of I, my power producers and then we're going to do a list of I, my power producers called reactors and that is also instantiated or initialized to a new list of I, my power producers. Now we could actually use the more specific interface for the reactors, but I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, and it really doesn't matter because we don't need it. So I'm just going to do the IMI power producers because it's it's easier. So then what we have to do is we have to add them in. So after we set the functional value, we will say, oh, that's one thing we have to do here is determine whether or not these reactors are functional. So if the reactor inventory dot current mass equals zero then functional equals false so if there's no fuel in the reactor it's not functional whether it's turned on or it's it's turned off it's not auxiliary power and it's not main power because it doesn't work without fuel now back to this scatterbrains um, hydrogen engines dot add producer so now all the hydrogen engines are going to be tacked onto this list. This is basically going to filter them in addition to doing everything else that it's doing. It's going to say, okay, all the hydrogen engines go in here, all the reactors go in here, batteries you don't have to do anything with because connecting those to cargo doesn't make any sense. Um, the same thing with solar panels and uh, wind turbines if we ever you know, need to care about those on a, on a different vessel or a different station or whatever. I guess that, that's not important, so we don't need lists for those. We just need lists for these two. So hydrogen engines add the producer and then reactors add producer so the next thing we need to do is go ahead and create our function and that's going to be static float search connected items so we're going to search for connected items we're going to have a list of I my terminal blocks because it may not be power producers that we're searching for connected items at some point like we're also going to want to find um, uh, ice that's connected to the, the O2H2 generators and the O2H2 generators are not power producers and if the the cargo in the if, if the ice in the various cargo containers around the ship is not connected to the, the O2H2 generators, then it's not useful to us. So we don't necessarily want to search for um, 
things that are connected to power producers. We want to search for things that are connected to any kind of blocks at all. Uh, so these are destination blocks. And then we want to search for I, my inventory item. And then I'm also going to pass in a Boolean here for require all. So I was talking about, you know, earlier, do we care if, you know, the, the items that we're looking for are only available to one of the items or some, you know, multiple of the items in the list, but not all of them. And this is our, our parameter for deciding whether or not we do. And we're going to default that to false. So by default, it's going to return everything that's available to any of them. But if we set that to true, it's only going to return everything that's available to all of them. So that's our function. And outside of this loop here, we are going to say float total ice. Because we weren't adding up ice as we went through here, we were adding up uranium, so we have, you know, we have to make sure this is declared up here. But actually, I'm going to declare it up there too for ice, just because it's needed to keep it all in one place. Total ice mass equals zero F. So then down here, we're going to say total ice mass plus equals. search connected items hydrogen engines um, I don't remember how to do this because you can't just like type in ice like it's not that simple you have to create a inventory item for it to filter against and it's my inventory item, not I my inventory item, so I gotta fix that. Constructors, item type. You into my fixed point. Oh, that's messy. Item ID. All right, that's not what I want to do. How does this work? Okay, so in and I my inventory. Get item amount. Find item with my item. Oh, I was looking at my inventory item. We want my item type. Because my item type just has a type ID and a subtype ID. We don't have to worry about an item ID or an amount or anything crazy like that. Because we're not worried about the amount. We're not worried about the, the uh, item ID. Because that's something that's unique to every individual stack in inventory is the item ID. And we're only worried about the, uh, the type and the subtype. And I think... That is basically or ice. I think that's the type ID and the subtype ID. We're going to have to test that and, and play with it a little bit. In any case, we need to change this because we are not searching for I my inventory item. We are looking for a my item. So this is going to be a new my item type or ice. I 
think that's right. Gosh, problem so far. Okay. Uh, cannot convert from that to that. Code pa yeah, I know about the not all code pass returning a value. Can I cast that? Is that going to be a problem? No, can't convert. Let me see if there's a common interface here in the hierarchy. Uh, this is why I try not to write code on camera. Because I don't actually know what I'm doing. I my power producer implements I my terminal block. So that should work. Why didn't that work? My terminal block has good inventory on it, right? At least tell me that much. Yeah. Okay. Because it's the inventory that really matters. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Instead of declaring these as lists of power producers, we're going to declare them as lists of terminal blocks. then we don't have to worry about converting this. We might still have to convert the blocks themselves when we add them. Yeah. Cannot convert to that, and then cannot convert to that. Okay. So that means that when we add it, that work? No, I still can't convert it. Because hmm. I need this to take in anything. All right. This is going to be really, really bad because I always forget how to do this. We're going to try passing this in as we're creating a generic. So it can take either. I'm going to keep these as power producers. Speaking of scrolling, we can do it on separate, or we can scroll over now, like scrolling to the side is a thing, but it still makes for cleaner code that looks better if you don't have to, so I'm going to fix that. Cut that one off there. And add that one back in there. And then this one we will break here and tab over. Does that work? Okay. Um, T. Put there too. Has to come first. All right, fine. Be a stickler. Let's 
cannot convert from my terminal block to a power producer. On 106, which one's 106? Neither of them. All right, well, if we just remove that. Oh, because we're trying to add a terminal block to a thing. All right, not all code pass return value. Perfect. That's the one that I wanted to get to because I know it doesn't return a value. I haven't told it to return a value yet. All right, so <laughs> complicated programming stuff. This is what's called a generic function. And I don't have to worry about this ever in JavaScript because JavaScript is like a gymnast. It's lots of fun to play with, but there's something wrong with anything that bends that way. JavaScript doesn't care about types. As long as it eventually finds the attributes and methods it's looking for, it doesn't care what the official quote-unquote type of it is. Everything's an object as far as JavaScript's concerned. So, you know, you want to pass in a, a power producer and it's looking for a terminal block. As long as the methods are there, it doesn't care. C Sharp, on the other hand, cares about data types. Um, and a lot of times you can cast... Like uh, right here, for example, where we're counting the current mass, which is a my fixed point, and adding it into a float. You can cast between a my fixed point and a float. It's it's a fairly straightforward operation to do that. On the other hand, apparently, um, if you're trying to cast an i my power producer into an i my terminal block, even though i my power producer has all of the same methods and implements the same interface as an i my terminal block, it won't let you cast it. So instead what we're doing is we're calling a generic function that will take a list of any data type as long as the data type is both a class, meaning it's actually an object, it's not an interface or a reference, and that the class is inherited from I my terminal block. So a power producer is a terminal block. So we can pass any terminal blocks into this method and it will not complain about it. So we're passing in power producers. We're assuming that it's at least an I terminal block. Power producer is a terminal block, so therefore it works. That's a really horrible explanation, I think, probably. Hopefully that makes enough sense. Um, but yeah, I'm going to call that an explanation and move on. Uh, all right, so now the first thing we need to do is we need to... Um, this probably actually shouldn't be static because we need access to the grid terminal system. Yeah, this is not going to be static. We could just pass in the grid terminal system, but really there's not much reason to do that. I mean, frankly, making these static isn't entirely necessary. There's some sort of performance boost, I think, that goes along with making them static, but it's minimal, and so I'm not going to bother with it. It's as easier just to have access to the, the member properties and stuff and not make it static. So the first thing we need to do is we need to find everything, and I mean everything, that is connected to all of the destination blocks that has an inventory and has the item in it. Um, so we're going to use the grid terminal system to do that. Dot get dot get blocks of type. Now we actually need all types. You know, it, it doesn't matter what the, the type is. Um, but the get blocks function that is also attached to the grid terminal system that's used for getting blocks regardless of their type doesn't have a filter parameter, so we can't filter them. We can only do that with get blocks of type. So I'm using get blocks of type. Um, but first we need to create a list of i my terminal block connected blocks is a new list of i my terminal terminal block. Whoa. I can type, guys. Um, so get blocks of type. I, my terminal block. Put it into connected blocks and filter it based on block. Pass into this function. And this is where the bunch of our work is actually going to go. So this is determining which blocks we are actually going to return here. Um, because it's get blocks of type, 
and the, the type that we're looking for is any terminal block, this would actually return everything by default. But it gets passed through the filter first, so the filter is where we determine which actual blocks we actually care about. Um, so that we don't actually end up with all of them in the, the list of connected blocks. So first of all, uh, if not, what's that variable called? Include connected. So if we're not supposed to be including connected stuff, and block, and yeah, if block, no, if not block dot same is same construct is same construct as me return false. So if we're only looking for connected stuff and this, or if we're only looking for stuff that's actually on the grid, not stuff that's connected, um, and it's not on the same grid, return false. We're not going to include it. So this is defaulted to false right now. The is connect, include connected is defaulted to false. So we're not supposed to include any ice, for example, that's on in a large cargo container on the industrial complex. So that will be true. Include connect, not include connected is true because include connected is false. Think about it for a second. It, it makes sense. Um, and the block that we're looking at is not on the same construct as the programming block. So the large cargo container down here on the industrial complex is not the same construct as me and we're not including connected blocks so we return false and it does not get added into the list. So that's our first filter. Next filter is if block dot no if not block dot as inventory return false so if the block doesn't have an inventory return false um, uh, that's going to be problematic when we're searching for well it's not because gas tanks do have an inventory so like the hydrogen tank has an inventory, even though there's nothing actually in the inventory that we're concerned about. Um, that's going to be kind of a thing. We're going to have to do that in a separate function. It's going to be a very similar to this, and I'll figure out what the commonalities are in refactor because I don't want to think about it right now. But this is going to be search for connected items. Search for connected gas is going to be a different method for the time being, and we'll, we'll refactor the commonalities into you know, what we can at a later point. So if block has inventory, return false. Um, if not, uh, no, for int i equals zero, i is less than block dot inventory count, i plus plus if mm, if not block dot get inventory i dot what's the method I'm looking at the terminal blocks so I need to go back to the inventory if I'm inventory so we've got the inventory now for the block and there is a specific method here uh, 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 is connected to then we actually need to expand this loop Okay, so, yeah, we need to expand the loop. That's the thing. For each, I know each T block in 
destination box. So for every block in the destination blocks list, and we don't know what the type is, we need to loop through the block inventories and say uh, do I care about that? Because technically the destination blocks could also have multiple inventories. I'm trying to decide if I care. I don't even think we really need to care about multiple inventories in the blocks we're checking. I'm going to not do that. If it breaks, we'll reevaluate. But I think I'm just going to say check inventory zero. We already know it has an inventory if it got this far. So that has already returned. That has already been, tr been true. So we know it has inventories. So if block.getInventory0 is connected to, and I can't use block, because that's what we're calling the block that we're checking. So this is going to be D block. For each D block in destination block, if block get inventory 0 is connected to D block dot get inventory zero and there's a not at the beginning of that so if it's not connected let me check my parentheses real quick here yeah return false so as soon as we find a block that is not connected to either of the or any of the blocks in our, our list of destination blocks we return false and not include it and we'll change that logic for the next iteration through here if require all is set to false. So for each D block and destination blocks, if the block inventory is not connected to the the D block inventory, return false. Now For our particular use case, I still don't think it matters about multiple inventories, but just for the purposes of, of scalability, because at this point it's relatively simple, I am going to do all of them. Um, if, no, for and i equals zero, i is less than block dot inventory count. I plus plus if block not if not block dot get inventory I dot contains item I think is what it's called I'm gonna double check that contains items. I don't want that. I want find item. Yeah. Although at this point we're starting to get into the actual logic here is find item legit returns the, the inventory item but that's I don't know how that'll work because if there's multiple stacks I don't know which one it returns so we don't want contains item I forgot what the function was called I know how to do this. It was called find item. Find item. Item. Equals null. Return false. And I think that's it. 
Okay, so function declaration, new list, get blocks of type everything. If the block isn't connected or isn't part of the isn't part of the same grid, and we don't want blocks that aren't part of the same grid, then bail, return false. If it doesn't have an inventory, return false. If it's not connected to both or all of our destination blocks, because we're going through each block and saying, is it connected to the, the, the block? Is the block we're looking at connected to the, block we're lo the other block we're looking at? If it's not connected, return false. So as soon as we find one of these things in the list that it's not connected to, we're going to return false. Um, and then for each inventory in the block, oh, that's not a good idea. Because as soon as it finds an inventory that doesn't have it in there, even if the other, even if a different inventory does, it will return false. So that's not what we want to do. We want to say boolean found equals false start it off as false and if block dot get inventory dot find item and I didn't want that not there anyway because that would have been a problem does not equal null so if we find the item there we're going to say found equals true and then we'll just return found. All right, so now again, if it's not the same grid and we're not looking for stuff off grid, return false. If there's no inventory, return false. If there's no conveyor connection to every block in the list, return false. Then we initialize found to false and we say for each inventory in the block we're checking, if you find the item we're looking for, and set found to true, even if you don't find it in a different one, set found to true, and then return found. So if it's found, it'll return true. If it's not found, it'll return false. I think that is correct. And this will end up checking the gas gen for the, the hydrogen engines. We search for ice. It'll end up finding all of the ice in the O2H2 generators and technically all of the ice in the uh, in the cargo containers too but there aren't any there isn't any ice in the cargo containers so return found now we have a list of connected blocks so here we will say um, float found items Initialize to zero. And then for each I my terminal block. Block, we can use block again now because this was limited in scope to this filter function. We're done with the filter function now. So for every block in connected blocks which will just be blocks that have the correct inventory item in it for int i equals zero we can use i again because that is also limited in scope actually to this for loop so we're outside of that for loop we can use it again i is less than block dot inventory count i plus plus found 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 items plus equals block dot get inventory i dot there's a specific method that counts all of it get item amount
we're going to see how many errors I have. When I'm done here in a minute. Get item. Amount of item. And we're going to have to cast this because that returns a, my fixed point. Close the for loop. Close the for each loop. If not no. If require all return found items. And, and then in this section, we will basically do this exact same thing here, except for this part. We're not going to immediately return false if it's not connected to both. We'll do something more similar to this, where we'll make a determination on whether it's connected to any of them. Um, but we'll come to that later, and I don't think that actually matters for the time being. Um, well, it doesn't matter for the time being, because all the ice that we have is connected to both hydrogen engines, ultimately. So, hydrogen engine add producer, search for connected items, hydrogen engines for ice. Errors. That's not so bad. 145, didn't close a parenthesis. Um, yes, it did. It's right there. One forty-five. There's no parentheses there. What are you talking about? It's connected to. Oh, there it is. Because get inventory is a function call and is connected to as a function call, but then the if condition in its entirety also needs that. Object or reference is required for the non static field method or property. 127. Okay, you can pick that right randomly. So what now? I don't understand the problem. Static. Oh. Oh. It's actually this that it has a problem with, even though it said 127, which is all the way down here. This is a static method, and we're calling a non static method. So that's a problem. And the easiest solution that doesn't require as much work is just to make that not a static method either. Compilation successful. Alright, so that compiled anyway. I don't yet know if it works. Because I need to stick that in here. Instead of hard coding zero. So now this should be like 20,000, I think. Or it's going to explode. That's what it's going to do, is it's going to explode. Excuse me, given key was not present in the dictionary. Key not found. Get item. 
in display power summary. So that was for the the um, item type here. I'm pretty sure. Whatever it is here. Uh, new my item type or ice. Well, what is it supposed to be? Um, I'm at an hour. I'm tempted to cut this here, but I don't actually know if it works. And that's troublesome to me. So this should work now and just say zero. Compile it. I'm pretty sure it still did it anyway because it's kind of finicky. But yeah, now this doesn't throw an exception because that's the line that it was on. But I don't know off the top of my head now how to instantiate an item type, a my item type, specifically for ice. Mm. What is the easiest way to force something to display that for me? So I'm getting, I'm pulling one of the O2H2 generators. It doesn't particularly matter which. Um, and then I'm pulling its inventory. And then I want to get the item. In there at index zero. Because that's just the first one in there. It doesn't really matter. But I know there's going to be one there. And then I need to get the item type. So where did it go? Here. Uh, get item at is what it's actually called get item at zero and that returns uh, my inventory item so then I need to do item type dot it's a type ID uh, I think it's item type that I want there okay so I'm my inventory get item at returns to my inventory item my inventory item has a type it's not item type it's just type which is a data type my item type which has a type ID and a subtype ID this in an interpolated string because it's easier dot 
type ID. And then we're just going to do it all again. Temp dot get inventory zero dot get item at zero dot type dot subtype ID. All right, I think that'll work. Either that or it's going to explode. It's going to explode, yay. Uh, can I completely convert? Yeah, okay. My inventory item does not contain a definition for type. What? Yes, it does. It just said it did. All right, well, first of all, we'll cast this. We know we need to do that. As I, my gas generator. My inventory item does not contain a definition for type. I was literally just looking at it. I'm reasonably sure that it does. Okay, inventory item. Dot type. My inventory item number type. It's right there. Um, Alright, well what if we just tried doing two string? I'm not convinced this will give us the actual information that we need, but it'll at least show us we're on the right path. My object builder underscore or slash ice. Okay, do I need the my object builder then? What's this shenanigan thing over the top? Oh. Oh, it's showing us the amount. Okay. So when you do my inventory item to string, it gives you the amount times the type. And then, so I'm assuming that this is amount x type ID slash subtype ID. At least that's what I'm hoping. So the amount we don't need to worry about. So instead of or.ice, it's... No, oh crap, what did it say? My object builder. So instead of just or, this needs to be my object builder underscore or. Alright, no exceptions. And this should be 5,200? No. Awesome. So something's not working somewhere along the way. In any case, we are done with this. So I'm pretty sure I have the dictionary stuff right, because if I didn't, I'd get the exception that I got last time.
So tidal ice mass starts off as zero and then somehow ends up at zero. Because I am actually inserting it here. Yeah, we're definitely running long. I hope you guys didn't have anywhere to be. That's what pause is for. Deal with it. Uh, float dot. No, don't dot. Found ice. Cannot convert from float to strain, really. I can do it for you, I'd be happy now. Zero. Alright, so it's not finding any blocks, but we know there are blocks, so that means we're doing this wrong. This is the advantage of not having it be static, is we have access to echo. Uh, echo block dot custom name. So first we'll make sure we're finding blocks. There's blocks, and this is like everything, because this is before any filters are applied. So this is all the blocks on all connected grids. Now if we come back in here and we move this echo down below this one, this should just be the stuff that's connected to the colonizer itself. And we shouldn't see any assemblers or refineries on here. Okay, looks like that's working correctly. Next. I'll keep that there for now. Next, we'll check if it has an inventory. So this should remove things like batteries and lights and engines. No, not engines. Yeah, engines. I don't know about engines because they technically have a fuel inventory. I don't know if that counts, though. Thrusters for sure will be removed. Okay, reactor, gun, drill, cockpit, tank. Yeah, okay, so it doesn't include engines. Alright, so so far so good. Point is the O2, H2 generators are still there, and that's where the ice is, so that's what really matters. Because I know the ice is in there. I synced it. All right, so now we're checking for a connection. Is there a conveyor connection? If there's not a conveyor connection between the block we're looking at and the engines, then it'll return false. Though, engines don't technically have an inventory, so this is probably where it's failing. We could end up with nothing here. Yeah, we're in with nothing here. Alright, how do we manage that? Because technically, I guess this method is for connecting inventories, and if the engine doesn't technically have an inventory, then there's no conveyor connection. But there is a conveyor connection, like, that's how it works. All right, let me take a look at the API here real quick and see if I can figure something shenaniganry out to make that work. So how about cube block maybe? Something to do with that? Implements entity.
this one does inventory count and stuff. Get inventory. That's not helpful. This is a, this is a struggle because the hydrogen engines don't have their own API yet. So like there's some issues here with trying to deal with it. You know what I'm going to do? Just so this episode doesn't feel like a complete waste of time with me being like, hey, this, that, and the other thing. Oh, look, none of it works. Awesome. Um, what we're going to do is instead of doing the hydrogen, we're going to do found uranium. We're going to search through the reactors for an item type ingot uranium we're going to look at found uranium and we're going to add found uranium total uranium mass. So I figured out why this isn't working. I haven't yet figured out how to fix it. Um, and this is actually going to come up with zero because all the uranium that we've got on the ship at the moment is actually in the reactors. Although I might try to count these twice, and that'll be a problem. We'll deal with that. Okay, so this is showing us everything, every inventory that's connected, and that is all correct. It's saying it found 200, and then it's going to try to add that. So does that? Yeah, it says 400. Okay, so we forgot a filter. <laughs> And it should really be the first filter because it's the easiest one. If We don't want to return the block that we're already looking at, because that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. So the small reactors should now be out of here, and they are, and we're finding zero because there's no uranium anywhere else. But now if we go into inventory, now first before we go into inventory, I want to go to the small reactors here and turn off the conveyor system because I don't want to pull any of this in. So now if I pull some of this extra uranium, no, I don't want that one reactor. I want that to go into the cockpit. Sure, why not? So if I do this and pull in 50, this should now refresh to, no, it's pulling it out. But it worked. It's refreshing there. You see how it pulled it up to 248 now? But the problem is that it's pulling it all back into the other reactors that don't have the conveyors turned off. It's not pulling it into these reactors because I turned off the conveyors, but it is pulling it into the other ones because they are technically connected. So I'll go ahead and throw that back in there. That will go back to 200 even. But that is working correctly. That's working the way that we want it to. I might have to figure something out about making those conveyors not steal everything. But that's a separate issue. So now we've got 100 in the mega miner, 100 in each of the colonizer reactors, and then the rest is in the industrial complex reactor. <coughs> and I will do some research and some tinkering. 
to see if I can figure out, um, no, because the, oh, um, it's because the engine doesn't have inventory, that's why we're having problems, I'll figure out if I can, you know, have some way of making sure that the, the inventories we're checking for ice are actually connected to the hydrogen engines, because if it's not connected to the engines, then it doesn't really matter if it's got ice in it, or whatever. So, I will work on that between episodes, try to figure that out. I apologize for the episode being so long. We were working all that out, and we did have some troubleshooting to do as well. Um, but subscribe, and uh, we'll see if I can figure something out or not, uh, and, you know, what happens next generally. Uh, likes, comments, verbal abuse. If you have any suggestions or any ideas of, you know, how to do that, I'd, I'd love the help. Although I might figure it out before this episode even airs, hopefully, fingers crossed. Uh, thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time.